Intubation can be actually surprisingly difficult in these guys. Um, they're almost like a brachycephalic. And yes, most of our patients, we can get tubes in without laryngoscopes, without any problems. Um, but in these guys, they, they really have these short, wide, fat, thick tongues um, that will often obscure the, the laryngeal area. Um, the larynx is actually surprisingly small. Um, sometimes the soft palates seem relatively long in them. Um, so having a laryngoscope on hand can be really useful. The laryngeal tissues are also fairly um, delicate, uh, much more delicate than an adult dog, and so we want to be a little bit careful. And you definitely want to have an appropriate endotracheal tube size available. Um, and you know, in some of these guys, even I'll use a, an appropriately sized uncuffed endotracheal tube because it allows me to place a bit larger tube than what I can with a cuffed tube. So, so make sure you have uh, um, the appropriate tubes available. As far as maintenance of anesthesia, isoflurane, sevoflurane, or desflurane are typically the, the drugs we're going to use. Halothane is no longer available, um, so unless you have a huge stash of it somewhere um, in your clinic, I'm guessing you're probably not using that. Um, and then, you know, as far as your choice between isoflurane, sevoflurane, and desflurane, a lot of that's going to depend on your vaporizer. All these drugs work very well. They all have very similar um, cardiopulmonary characteristics. Um, they just have different clinical characteristics, so things like speed of induction, recovery, degree of hangover, and so forth. Um, I tend to use non-rebreathing systems in a lot of these guys, especially the little tiny ones. Um, so I'm using a Bain or a Jackson Reese um, type system. Or alternatively, more and more, I'm actually using low volume neonatal circuits. Um, there's several different types available, and there's some that have no more dead space than what you would have with a um, non-rebreathing system. And so I do tend to use a lot fewer non-rebreathing systems than I would have, say, five to ten years ago. And I tend to use a lot more circle systems, even in the very, very, very small patients. Um, because some of the historical issues associated with using a circle system were the soda lime causing resistance, um, the valves causing some resistance to breathing, but a lot of that's been discounted in the fact that most of the resistance of breathing is actually results from the, the diameter of the endotracheal tube or the diameter of the trachea, and very little is actually accounted for by the um, valves or the soda lime. And so really the resistance created by the soda lime and the valves um, is, um, is nothing and is, is a moot point compared to the resistance created by the diameter of the uh, endotracheal tube. Do definitely pay attention to pop-off valves. Um, accidents can happen very quickly, especially when using non-rebreathing systems. Um, and that's probably closed pop-off valves are probably the number one accident that I heard about or that I've seen. So I think you really want to pay attention. Intermittent positive pressure ventilation is often necessary because these guys don't really always breathe that well. Um, and I use relatively low pressures in them, sort of five to 10 centimeters of water pressure. As far as intraoperative support goes, I do usually give them fluids. The fluid rate may be anywhere from 5 to 20 mL per kilo per hour, and I, de I, de and I determine that based on the individual patient's needs. You will find that there's a fair amount of variability associated with the, um, the rates that are recommended in the literature. Warm fluids or not warm fluids? I guess, you know, if you can warm them, great. Um, would I put them in the microwave to warm them? Probably not do something like that, but um, maybe run them. Um, through, uh, you know, a warm, um, a couple of warm pads or something to sort of warm the fluids as they're going in. Where this becomes really significant is when you're giving a lot of volumes of fluids, so where you're resuscitating a patient and so forth. Um, one of the things I'll often use is a burette or a syringe driver on these guys. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with burettes, um, a burette is basically a 120 to 130 mil reservoir that attaches onto your um, your fluid bag that you can fill up to 100 or to 50 mils and administer the fluids through a drip set um, by gravity. And even if someone forgot about the drip set or left it, left it wide open, you're not going to give the patient a whole liter of fluids. You're only going to give it as much as in your, is that's in your barrette. So it does allow you a little bit of safety. Um, dextrose may or may not be added to the fluids. It really depends. Um, I don't think it's any, there's anything wrong with adding it up to maybe 2.5% in um, a very young patient, say one under 12 weeks on a routine basis, but I think checking glucose throughout the procedure is, is certainly the most prudent way to uh, monitor the patient. Um, definitely avoid hypothermia if you possibly can, minimize the anesthesia time, and certainly rewarm. As far as monitoring goes, 
Um, monitoring these guys uh, is exceptionally frustrating because of their size and often the drapes and everything else get in the way and so um, there is a lot of uh, challenges to monitoring these guys. One of the other problems associated with the really small patients is that there's really insu insu insufficient sometimes signal strength relative to noise um, and all these machines are designed to optimize um, the, the ratio of signal to noise and with a very small patient a lot of these instruments may detect the actual signal as noise and discount it. Um, sometimes the parameters will exceed the ranges um, in some of these monitors, so, so it really can be challenging. I think one of the things you really want to do when you're evaluating um, anesthetic monitors is to ensure that the monitor will work even when we have situations of very, very uh, minimal signal strength. Um, and this is also really important when we have even an adult patient becomes hypotensive because the signal strength reduces and yet that's when we want the instrument to work, you know, that's when we really need the instrument to work is when the signal strength is really low. As far as my minimally acceptable intraoperative monitoring criteria, um, definitely you have to be assessing the patient, you have to be assessing depth, there, there's no questions about that. Um, pulse oximetry to me. Um, is essential as well. This is something we use to assess oxygenation. We know that mucous membrane color um, is a very poor indicator of um, desaturation. When they turn blue, they're quite desaturated um, in most circumstances. Um, blood pressure on every patient, um, couldn't stress that enough. Um, and certainly temperature and then heart rhythm. Um, uh, and certainly that can be done through auscultation or an ECG. And now I say this is my minimal acceptable. Um, certainly I would encourage anyone to develop um, greater skill at other um, uh, monitoring modalities such as capnography and so forth um, to really evaluate your patient more thoroughly. As far as blood pressures go, I'd just like to make the comment, um, expect lower blood pressures in these patients. Um, neonates, so patients under sort of four weeks of age, their normal awake pressures are around 50 millimeters mercury. That's their normal awake mean blood pressure. So I wouldn't really expect them to have blood pressures up at the 60, um, which is normally where we'd like them to be. And as far as pediatrics go, by 12, 28 to 36 weeks, they usually have a mean blood pressure somewhere in the 80 um, um, millimeter mercury range, which is pretty close to what an adult would have. Um, one of the things I will say, though, is I find a lot of these pediatric patients are hard to maintain their blood pressures much above 60, um, even the ones that are sort of 28 to even 36 weeks out. Um, you'll occasionally run into a few of those that you really struggle to maintain the blood pressures above 60. And, you know, in a lot of these guys, I'll consider 60 acceptable. In a patient that's 12 to 16 weeks, I'll consider 50 acceptable. Um, but again, and the other thing I think that I always stress to people too is it's not the absolute number that's the most important. We also need to be thinking about perfusion to the tissues because ultimately that's why we're using that um, blood pressure measurement is to give us an indication of perfusion to the tissues. And you can have really very high blood pressures and very poor tissue perfusion by using a vasoconstricting drug. So it's not all about just the pressure. You want to be thinking about are my, am I actually perfusing the tissue? And again, and so sort of, you know, to just my final comment on that is there really is no specific guidelines regarding acceptable um, blood pressures in pediatric patients during anesthesia. I think if you talk to a number of anesthesiologists, we'd all say a different number is our cutoff. Um, you know, for example, if you asked me, I'd probably say 12 to 16 weeks, 50 is acceptable. Um, if you said 16 to 28 weeks, I'd probably say, you know, 60 is acceptable. Um, yeah, but it really would depend a little bit on the individual patient and the anesthesiologist you talk to. Just want to talk a little bit about the management of hypotension. Uh, obviously, um, it's very similar to what we do in the adult patient, just the anesthetic depth, um, administer fluid therapy, um, but keep in mind that they have a low tolerance for changes in preload um, and because of the decreased ventricular compliance and sympathomimetics may or may not work in them as well as we would hope. So uh, managing hypotension in these guys can be a little more challenging. I'll just say a couple words about capnography in the pediatrics. Um, certainly there's two different, and I, you know, I sort of mentioned the fact that you know, capnography wasn't considered one of my minimum requirements for um, uh, anesthetic monitoring, but certainly it's useful. And so we definitely have mainstream and side stream, and, and I, can't, I, you know, I can't go into those in a lot of detail in this presentation, um, but suffice it is to say that uh, both will add dead space, and if you're using a 
um, side stream capnograph, you will get unreliable end tidal CO2 values. And you know, this is related to the low tidal volume of these patients and their low expiratory volumes. Um, the dilution of fresh gas or dilution of the expired gases with fresh gas flow. Um, and so we can overcome some of these issues with a side stream by feeding a catheter down in towards the endotracheal tube, um, which will then measure um, the, uh, the uh, CO2 further down. And if anyone wants more information on this, um, you're certainly welcome to call me. Um, there are numbers available on the website. <coughs> Analgesia, I, you know, I really use very similar principles to what I would use in an adult. Um, I don't change things a whole lot just because they're a neonate. I assume they're going to be painful, and I assume they're going to need appropriate analgesic therapy. So systemic opioids would be certainly, definitely, above all, they would be the foundation of my anesthetic protocol. Local and regional anesthetic techniques I would use um, when and where appropriate. Definitely keep in mind the risk of overdosing. These are small patients, so... You, know, you do want to calculate your toxic doses before you reach for the drug and start giving it to the patient. NSAIDs would normally be a part of my um, analgesic protocol of most adult patients, but in the neonate, I'm a little bit more conservative with the NSAIDs because we know that whether it's COX-1 or COX-2, both those uh, enzymes are important in some of the early uh, neonatal development um, uh, aspects, in particular the renal system. And one dose probably isn't going to impact that renal system very much, uh, but multiple doses may over several days. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that all the side effects of the NSAIDs will be exacerbated or made worse by a dehydrated patient. So you want to be sure you're using them appropriately if you're using them in these patients. So I've sort of already mentioned some of these things, um, you know, NSAIDs in the uh, perioperative uh, period, definitely I probably uh, tend to avoid them in these guys because of the increased risk of uh, intraoperative hypotension and with hypotension comes increased risk of NSAID toxicity. Um, so I probably tend to avoid them in some of the, in the neonatal patients, especially in the, in the intraoperative period. Uh, neonates for sure, pediatrics I would tend to, you know, use my, my clinical judgment. I've already mentioned the fact that COX may be important for early renal CNS development and maturation. And anytime I'm using an NSAID, I definitely weigh the risks versus the benefits and certainly speak to the owners about this. And again, I talk a little, lot about single versus continuous treatment. One dose is probably not going to impact um, too much development and maturation. Several doses over several weeks probably will. Uh, as far as recovery goes, um, continue to rewarm these guys. Um, I try to use very little sedation to get them to, uh, you know, return to very normal uh, behavior as soon as possible, but definitely give them adequate analgesia. Uh, if they're not eating appropriately, I'll be monitoring their glucose and certainly encouraging them to eat. So what about cats? Well, cats are basically the same issues, same principles. They are not small dogs. They are definitely cats. Um, you know, we do the same things, balanced anesthesia, we provide fluids, provide allergies, we monitor and keep them warm. And all drugs and protocols that I've discussed for dogs are appropriate for cats and can be used for cats. So I'll end this uh, presentation. I thank you for uh, coming to our website to look at it. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll check back often to see what we've posted. Okay, thank you very much.